Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, for the seminar, it's a pleasure to welcome Hugo Parlier from the uh, University of Luxembourg. And he will give a talk in uh, hyperbolic geometry, and the title is Curves, Surfaces, and Intersection. Uh, if you wish to ask questions during the seminar, it's better to ask them in the microphone. But it's not always easy to circulate it, but still, let's, let's try to... To, to ask the questions in the microphone. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to everybody for being here. Thank you very much to Nalini and the Collège de France for the invitation. It's, um, it's very nice to come from so far. So when Nalini says that I'm coming from Luxembourg, she's not referring to the park, but to, <laughs> to the country. Um, and what I want to talk to you about today is curves, surfaces, and intersection. And despite the, the, the logistical difficulties in handing the microphone around, please uh, don't hesitate and interrupt me if you have questions. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is joint with Bin Bin Xu, and some of it is with Peter Boozer as well. Okay. But really my goal, or at least one of my goals for the talk today, is to try to explain this picture to you, which you see on the left, and is to try to understand, in some sense, the space of all closed curves on a surface. And what I mean by that, I will explain. But um, it's about one of many different ways you can start to explore the dynamics of uh, closed curves on a surface and their relationship to hyperbolic geometry and lots of other things. But, all right, so keep in mind that at the end, if you don't understand that picture, then I haven't done my job. Okay, so what's my basic setup? It's going to be similar to what we've just seen. So throughout, I'm going to look at a topological surface. Of genus G greater or equal to 2. OK, so in my picture here, we should be thinking of something like this. So the genus is the number of connected uh, components. It's the num number of tori of which I'm taking the connected sum. So in this case here, my genus G is equal to 3. My surfaces will always be closed and orientable, um, unless I say otherwise. And what I'm interested in is curves on surfaces. So what is a curve, as far as I'm concerned? A curve is simply a map, OK, the image of a continuous map um, from the circle to my surface. Okay, so I take a, a circle and I map it continuously to my surface. And when I say a curve, the way I'm going to be thinking of a curve, I'm going to be thinking of curves as being, what am I going to be thinking? So I want them to be non-trivial, right? by which I mean that they're not homotopic to a point. Okay. I want them to be primitive which means, so Nalini mentioned this during her, her course, this means that once I have a, a, the image of a curve, okay, I can take that curve and I can do it several times. Right? So I'm not allowing that. I'm only looking at curves with the image, one single image, right? the primitive version. And I'm thinking of them as unoriented objects. Okay, unless I specifically say otherwise. And the most important bit is I'm thinking of curves up to homotopy. So in this case, it's up to free homotopy.
Okay, so from the topological point of view, if I take two curves, for instance, this very beautiful curve, okay, that's a very nice curve, or this one, from the point of view of free homotopy classes, those two curves are the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to say something very controversial right now. Is that a multi-curve is a collection of curves. So those of you who are not used to this business won't understand how controversial that sentence is. But I've noticed that there are three things one should never talk about if you don't want to argue with somebody. It's religion, politics, and the definition of what a multi-curve is. Okay? So for me, a multi-curve is just a collection of curves. And I can see frowns in the audience already, so I will not look at the audience for this. All right. So what are my guiding questions throughout the talk? My guiding questions are going to be, how do I find a parameter set, so questions I'm interested in, So is there a good parameter set for the space of all curves? Mm -hmm. And there's many ways to answer this question. Um, but the way that I'm going to treat it, or look at it, is through intersection. And what I mean by intersection is intersection with other curves. Okay, so, so let me so let me get back to that in just a second. But the other thing I want to say, and this is also important, is that to the space of all curves, there's a parallel theory. And that's the study of closed geodesics on hyperbolic surfaces. So let me just say one word about this. So when you look at a curve, or a closed curve, on a surface, this is a topological object. None of this has anything to do with geometry. But, so here's my surface sigma. Here's my topological surface sigma. And I'm looking at curves up to free homotopy on this object. But associated to this, because I've carefully chosen my surface to have negative Euler characteristic, associated to this, I could choose a hyperbolic metric and put it on this. I could get a hyperbolic surface. I'll call X, right? Hyperbolic surface that topologically looks the same, but this time it has a metric. So this time I take, for instance, in the hyperbolic plane, I take some sort of polygon, which I, I won't continue to draw, and in the hyperbolic plane I can take a polygon and then start pacing it together exactly like I would if I was doing a topological construction. But this time I do it in a geometric way, just that this side here is the same length as this side here. Such as, for instance, this side here is the same length as this side here. And in a way such that when I pace it up, I get a smooth hyperbolic surface. So this means the surface whose metric locally looks exactly like a piece of the hyperbolic plane. Mm -hmm. And what is the parallel theory here? The parallel theory is that if I have a closed curve here, it corresponds exactly to a unique closed geodesic.
But this time, the closed geodesic is on the hyperbolic surface. Right? So I have a closed curve on the topological surface. This corresponds to the closed geodesic on the hyperbolic surface. And the cartoon image of this, which has been pointed out to me many times, is not a proof, but is at least an image of what's going on, is that a hyperbolic surface, so it's a surface that's negatively curved. What does that mean? Negatively curved means that if you think of this in terms of Riemannian geometry, you have a principal curvature that's going in one direction, and you have the other principal curvature that's going in the other direction. So you have something that's going this way and something that's going that way. Okay? So locally, your surface looks like some sort of uh, horse saddle. right? And so you have this negative curve phenomenon. And here's your homotopy class of closed curve that looks something like this, and you're in this negative curvature thing. And in this homotopy class, there's a unique geodesic. Maybe the better image for this is really in the hyperbolic plane, where this closed curve is going to be something that looks something like this. And then in the hyperbolic plane, you're going to have a unique geodesic that looks something like that. And so that's, the, that's how these two theories have something to do one with another. But as much as I, I'm going to really try, in some sense, to avoid the story of hyperbolic surfaces for, for lots of what I say. Okay? If I don't need them, I won't use them. But you'll see I'll keep jumping back to them because I like them. So, anyways. All right. And, in fact, I think the real goal for my talk is to avoid erasing this drawing. I think that's going to be the hardest part. Okay. All right. So, what I was talking about was intersection. Okay, so let me define what I mean by intersection. So we have alpha and beta that are closed curves. So let me define the intersection between alpha and beta. All right, so this is the intersection number between the two curves. And because I'm thinking of them as homotopy classes, the way I want to define them is some sort of minimal quantity like this. So what I do is I look at the all possible ways that I can represent alpha and beta, and I try to minimize the number of points in which they intersect. So this is the minimal cardinality of the intersection between all po possible representations of alpha and beta. So alpha prime will be a curve that's freely homotopic to this alpha, and beta prime will be a curve that's freely homotopic to this beta. Right? This is the way I'm defining intersection. But there's a caveat here. The way I'm doing this is that I'm supposing that there are no triple points. Okay? What this means is I want all my intersection points, if this is alpha and this is beta, or this is their representative, I want them all to look exactly like this. So this is allowed, but what is not allowed is something like this, where three Three, uh, I get three local arcs that intersect through the same point. So this is absolutely not allowed. Okay, so there's no triple points here. All right, so with this definition, I have a question for you, the audience. So here's a surface. Here's a curve. which I will call alpha. And my question for you is, what is the intersection between alpha and alpha? One. One. Any other guesses? Two. Very good. Any other guesses? So the answer is two, actually. All right, so, so, why, so, so why is this? So this, this? You want it to be one. You want the answer to be one, right? But the way that I've defined it, the answer is really two. So why is this? Because you try to minimize, I'm trying to minimize the intersection between one of alpha's representatives and one of alpha's representatives. And in fact, the way to minimize this is to do something like this. So the alpha is a curve that looks like that. 
Now I'm going to try to draw another curve that's homotopic to it. And the way I can minimize it is to do something like this. And if I look carefully at this drawing, in fact, there are two intersection points here and here. All right? So it's, it's a bit of a convention. So in fact, the answer from the audience is absolutely right. If I had said the number, what is the number of, of minimal self-intersections, that would have been correct. The answer would have been 1. But in fact, the way I've defined it, when I take the intersection between a curve alpha and itself, this will always be an even number, the way I've defined it. All right. And all right, so, so that's, that's just a small confusing caveat to confuse you, because it's important to confuse people as much as possible when you try to tell them something. OK, so, so the set of curves that self-intersect 2k times are going to play a particular part in what I'm going to say. And we're going to call them k curves. So let me write that down so I don't forget what the definition is. So alpha is a k curve if the intersection between alpha and alpha is equal to 2k. Okay. So, so this, is, this is a definition. And the set of k curves I will denote by ck. This is the set of k curves. And in particular, c0. These are called simple closed curves. And, and simple curves, um, simple curves are very nice because the reason they're called simple closed curves is because they're very simple. They, they leave simple existences. And they're very nice to look at. So simple curves are simple. And you can describe them, and this is what I'm going to tell you, in a very nice way using intersection. So these are called Ben Thurston coordinates. And let me tell you how they work. So you take a surface. Let's take a surface here of genus 3, like this. And you start by taking this surface and breaking it down into so-called pairs of pants by considering collections of simple curves that break this surface into pairs of pants. So I just keep taking curves until I can't take any more curves that are disjoint from the ones I had. And this is called, this is a pants decomposition. I'll call these curves alpha 1. And if you count them correctly, just using the Euler characteristic, you can find that there are exactly 3g minus 3 of them. And you take these curves, and now you look at a simple curve that's not in this set. And you look at what it looks like on the surface. And you can start looking at its intersections with exactly the curves in your pants decomposition. All right, so in my example here, I took that red curve. I look at the intersection with this curve. This gives me one intersection point. This curve, I get two intersection points. This curve, I get one intersection point. This curve, I get one intersection point. And this curve here, I get one intersection point. And these intersection points, intersections with these alpha i's, these determine a curve almost. And I'll tell you what they determine it up to in just a second. But let me just tell you what they determine. So when you have a pair of pants like this, so now I look at one of my pairs of pants. And, well, I have the intersection numbers that the curve has to form with these different elements. Okay, so maybe here I have 
four, three, and here I have to be careful, three. Mm -hmm. Something like this. And now, if I have these intersection numbers, there's only one way I can complete this picture. Right? So, so the, the fact of the matter is that, of course, I'm going to say this and then not manage to do it, but, well, in this case, I can. Right? So the picture necessarily looks like the picture I'm drawing here. There's no other way to complete this picture. So I know that whenever I have these intersection numbers, this is what my curve has to look like on the pair of pants. So from a topological point of view, there's no other way to complete the picture. Okay. Of course, this doesn't tell me what's happening exactly around these curves. So these are called dent twists or twists along these curves. So what this picture does not tell me is what is this curve doing, for instance, it does not, it's not able to tell me, it tells me that it looks sort of like this, and it looks sort of like this, but it doesn't tell me that this thing isn't wrapping around here multiple times. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what, so these intersection numbers give me a pretty good idea of what's going on, but they don't tell me how the curves wrap around these curves in the pants decomposition. And so for that I need other curves, but I can still do it. And so what I can do is I can look at this pants decomposition. So this is one of my curves alpha i. And I add in two other curves, which I'll call beta i and gamma i. And beta i and gamma i tell me the twists. Right? It tells me the behavior of the curves as it wraps around the, as it wraps around the pants curves. And all in all, if I put this all together, I have alpha 1 to alpha 3g minus 3. I have beta 1 to beta 3g minus 3. I have gamma 1 to gamma 3g minus 3. And the intersections with this set of 9g minus 9 curves tells me exactly what the simple curve is. Right, so, so the map, if you give me a curve, what I'm saying in other terms, if you give me a curve and I look at the intersection with these 9g minus 9 curves, then that map is injective. Right? So no two curves can have different intersection numbers. And this gives me a nice parameter set for the set of curves, in some sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, as, as I pointed out, um, I'm going to be jumping to the hyperbolic case for just a second. So, for the study of hyperbolic surfaces, simple curves and their geodesic cousins have played an important part. So, in the hyperbolic case, Okay, simple curves, simple closed geodesics are interesting, but rare. Okay, so, 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 so let me give you a few, uh, a few results which, which illustrate this point. So, so here's a first result. the theorem due to Huber, which is the following thing. So what you can do is you can, you can count the number of closed geodesics <coughs> such, that, such as their length is bounded by some constant L. So these are closed, the number of closed geodesics of length bounded by L. And what Huber showed is that I'm going to be using this sign for lots of things. In this case, it's the, just the asymptotic. The number of these curves is asymptotic to exponential L divided by L. Mm -hmm. And in contrast, you could ask the same thing for simple curves. Right? So, um, 
This time we ask simple closed geodesics, and we look at exactly the same function. Okay. And so in this case, we have exponential growth, I mean, something very particular and pretty that doesn't depend on the geometry of the surface. And in this case, you get polynomial growth. So this time, you get a polynomial. Its degree is 6g minus 6. And there's a constant in front that depends on the geometry of the surface. Right, so this is, this is a result from, I don't know, I guess published in 2007 or, or, or roughly. This is, you know, I don't know, this is 15, 13. I have no idea. I, this, all right, so it's, it was before I was born. Everything was before I was born. It would be 15, 13. Right, so, um, not, I, I know that's not true, but um, I forgot that this talk is recorded. Okay, I do this all the time. Anyways, so that's, that's one way in which you, you sort of see that the simple curves are very rare in a, in a geometric sense among the set of all curves. Another sense in which they're very rare is that closed geodesics on X are dense. Okay, if you're on a hyperbolic surface and you do exactly the the, the, the exponential flow that we were talking about for graphs before, but this time on a hyperbolic surface, then you're always arbitrarily close to a closed geodesic. Okay? You're arbitrarily close to coming back to where you were. Right? And this is in strong contrast to what happens for simple curves. This is a beautiful theorem of Berman in series, which in some sense was at the origin of lots of these results here is that simple closed geodesics are nowhere dense. Simple geodesics are nowhere dense. OK, so, so let me take this opportunity to use the excuse of talking about simple geodesics to show you a few pictures. There we go. It looks like I'm going to show you my vacation pictures, but it's not true. OK, so what you see here on the first slide, this is, um, this is the best picture. This is the most accurate one. This is the set of the closure of all closed geodesics on a hyperbolic surface. OK, so this is, this is, a, very, this is a very important slide. Okay, you're going to see in contrast to the simple ones. All right. So this is exactly the part that's joint with Peter Boozer. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're seeing here. So what you're seeing here is a fundamental domain for hyperbolic surface. So this is a polygon in the hyperbolic plane. And what you see is a single closed geodesic. Okay, so, so because the sides are associated, when you reach one side, for instance, if you are going along here and you go up here, then that side there is associated to this bottom side here. Then you will continue to go along here, for instance. Okay? And so, so what you see here is, is a single closed geodesic. And I'm just, this is sort of a confusing thing, but what you see now is a closed geodesic along which we've performed a den twist. So you see the effect of a den twist along a single closed geodesic. And the den twist that we've performed is exactly along something that's here. So you sort of, you see the effect of a den twist along a single closed geodesic. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea of what one curve looks like. And now we perform another den twist and you see that there's this sort of limiting behavior. All right, I, I really do feel like I'm showing my vacation pictures. Okay, this is, this here is an example. This, these are also, these are more multiple simple closed geodesics, but this time we're on a octagon, which is regular, and this is the most symmetric genus two surface that you can imagine. And what you see here are all the shortest closed geodesics on that surface. So one of these, it goes from here to here, is the shortest closed geodesic on the surface. You have one that goes from here to here, you have one that goes from here to here, and then over here, and from here to here. And they're all the same length in this particular case. And now I'm going to start showing you the next ones, and the next ones. And then, OK, lots and lots more. And you see that they sort of have this beautiful structure. This is particular to the case of this surface, because the surface that I've chosen to, to illustrate this with is a perfectly symmetric surface, the most symmetric surface you can imagine in genus 2. So you see a lot of the symmetry 
So, so like you first showed the shortest one, then the second shortest yes. one, then, okay. Yeah, I mean, more or less. I, 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 I'm cheating a little bit, so I, I left some of them out that were less pretty, but yeah. yeah. But more or less, yeah. But remind, I mean, keep in mind the theorem of, of Berman in series, which says that if you put all of them together, then you still get a nowhere dense set. I mean, you can sort of see that this, these surfaces here are becoming they look like they're becoming more and more dense, but in fact, so let's, let's look at this. They're, they're becoming more and more dense, but in fact, the Berman series theorem tells you that they're, they're, they're never completely dense, even though they, they look like they sort of have, they have this, this density that's sort of appearing. So now we take this surface here, this symmetric, and we deform it. So we deform it, we look at a hyperbolic surface that's homeomorphic to it, but not isometric. We've deformed the surface somehow, and you see how the Berman series set, or in this case, this set of geodesics, deforms as you deform the surface. Okay, and it becomes, and this is, one should take these pictures with a grain of salt in the sense that some of these phenomena are really due to genus two. So you have this concentration in these points, in these points, and these points, and these are due to the fact that these are particular points in genus two, which are called Weierstrass points, in which infinitely many closed geodesics intersect. So this phenomenon you wouldn't necessarily see in a higher genus. But nonetheless, because I get to show whatever I want, this is what I'm showing you. And here you can see, as you go, as you go move up, you can really see that concentration, these points I'm telling you about, these concentration points, these Weierstrass points that are here and here. You can really sort of see them as you look into more and more geodesics. And again, you can deform it, and you can sort of see what's going on. Okay, so I mean, this is just uh, as, 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 a, as a remark, this is something we proved with Peter Boozer a few years ago, is that in fact, on a surface of genus G, you can always find a disk that has a certain size that's disjoint from all simple closed geodesics. Okay. And all right, so, I mean, some would argue that this is barely a positive constant, even for genus equals two, but nonetheless, it is a positive constant. I mean, not that anybody in this universe would be able to see it, but anyways. But as you can see sort of from the picture, at least, and as you, we're gonna zoom in on that picture, you can see that, I mean, there's a reason that this constant isn't huge. It's that, in fact, for a set that's nowhere dense, I find them pretty dense, right? <laughs> as far as nowhere dense sets go, they're, 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 they're quite dense. Um, I also want to point out that this is a imp more important part, is first we made the pictures, and then we proved that the pictures actually are correct. So <laughs> we, the reason is, I mean, I'm not going to get into this because I have other things to tell you, but the reason is the way we make the pictures is that we go out, we take very, very long strands, and we make sure that there's no, self there's no intersection points. We haven't created any intersection points. And then after a while, our computers give up, right? And they say, okay, enough. Right? And then we show what we've produced. But in fact, this, this theorem that's up here that we were able to prove tells you that that's fine. In fact, if you're able to do that, if you're able to shoot out for long enough, and you haven't created any intersection points, then in fact, you're very close to being what you've really described at a local level is really very close to being on an actual simple closed geodesic. And so, so that's, that's what this theorem says. Okay. All right, let me go back to the, again, compare this with, with this beautiful picture of all closed geodesics. Okay. Okay. So there's lots of things that we could talk about with the, the theory of simple closed geodesics. One of the things that happens with simple closed geodesics and that distinguishes it from closed geodesics is the following phenomenon that does not happen for simple closed geodesics. So let me tell you what this phenomenon is, which is sort of one of the origins of why we were interested in this in the first place. So these are called length equivalent curves. And it's the following phenomenon. Okay, so what is this? So we have a hyperbolic metric. So on any x, hyperbolic. There exist alpha, I'm saying this the wrong way, okay. 
Um, Okay, so I got the order all wrong. But I will fix the order in just a second. All right, so the f f phenomenon is the following. For any alpha and beta, so let me erase that and put that over here. And now any hyperbolic metric, there exists, so there exist curves, closed curves, such that their geodesic representatives always have the same length. All right, so, so instead of telling you what that means, let me show you a picture. So here's a pair of pants that I can find on any hyperbolic surface. And my claim is that the following two curves always have the same length. Uh-oh, hold on. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to draw the pair of pants like this. Otherwise, it'll feel like I'm drawing it upside down. I'm sorry. All right, so here's a curve. I leave from here, I wrap around the boundary, and then I come back in the back. And then here, I wrap around here, I wrap around here, I come back around the back, and then here I come up here in front. Right. Do people see sort of the curve that I drew? And here, I'm going to draw another curve. It's the same pair of pants, I'm just drawing another picture. And this time, whenever I was in front, I'm going to go in back. And every time I was in back, I will go in front. Right? So this time, I'm going to wrap around like this, wrap around like this. Here in the back, I go in the back. And here I go in the front. I go in the back, sorry. And I wrap around here, and I wrap around here. And I look like that. Right? All right, so these are clearly two different homotopy classes of curves. Well, clearly. Well, Let's suppose that we all agree that these are two different homotopy classes of curves. Okay. And they always have the same length no matter what hyperbolic metric I put on the pair of pants. So why is that? That's because a hyperbolic pair of pants, if I look at it like this, I can do the following trick. I can look at an ortho geodesic. So the shortest geodesic that goes between one boundary curve and another boundary curve. And here another ortho geodesic and another ortho geodesic. And when I cut along these, this gives me two hexagons, one in the front and one in the back. Whoops. OK, I've cut along these two things. If I, if I took my pair of pants and I cut along exactly that seam there and the two seams there, I would show you two hexagons. And if my pants were hyperbolic, which they are not, my two hexagons would be isometric. So why is that? It's because in the hyperbolic plane, if you know the length of this, this, these sides, A, B, and C, then in fact you know exactly what the hyperbolic hexagon looks like. It's a small computation in hyperbolic trigonometry. And so that means that the front of my pair of pants looks like the back of my pair of pants. So there's a front-back symmetry that brings the front of the pair of pants to the back of the pair of pants. And what does it do to these homotopy classes? Everything that was in front goes in back, and everything that was in back goes in front. So in fact, it takes these two homotopy classes and it reverses them. And so that's more or less, modulo details, a full proof that you can find curves that have the same length for any hyperbolic metric. And so in a more sophisticated version, this is a result that's due to Horowitz and put in geometric terms by Randall. And, um, and you can repeat this operation and you can do all sorts of things with this. There's lots of interesting questions about these curves that are still not known. But one of the questions that was raised at the time was that there's a funny fact, which is that Um, length equivalent curves. So these are curves that have the same length no matter what hyperbolic metric you have. Intersect simple curves. So all simple curves. The same number of times.
And this is a troubling phenomenon because it tells you, in particular, that knowing the intersection with all simple curves, no matter how dense they look on the pictures that I'm showing you, in fact, will not help you distinguish between two length equivalent curves. If your goal in life is to distinguish between the red curve and the yellow curve, knowing the intersection with all simple curves will not help you. Mm -hmm. And why is this? This is not a difficult phenomenon to see. This is simply because if I look at a hyperbolic metric, and here's a simple curve, here's a sort of a local picture of a hyperbolic metric, something I can do to the hyperbolic metric, one of the deformations I can do is I can take it and I can squeeze it. Right? Uh, unlike my own pair of pants, I can squeeze this curve to be very, very, very thin. And when I squeeze this curve, the area has to stay constant. So what happens is that this becomes very, very long as I squeeze the curve. But what happens to a curve that intersects it? So if my curve intersected, if the yellow curve intersected it once and the red curve intersected it twice, this intersection will persist. The yellow curve will become longer, but the red curve will become twice as long, roughly. Right? You can't see it because they're, they're both, they're, they're, they're parallel traveling at one point. Okay? And so this, this phenomenon here tells us exactly this fact. Right? And so, so that's, that's an interesting phenomenon. So you can have curves that intersect all the simple curves the same number of times. And so immediately what do you guess? I mean, what did people guess at the time when people figured this out? They immediately guessed, hallelujah, that's exactly what length equivalent curves are. Those are exactly curves that intersect all simple curves the same number of times. And people believe this for some time. This was sort of, you know, at the end of the Middle Ages. And, and so people would believe this and went around saying this on, on, on repeatedly, that this is exactly what length equivalent curves were, until Chris Leninger came around and said, no, that's not true. Okay, so as a result of Chris Leninger, it's, 2003, I think, or something like that. It says the converse is false. And I won't get into Leninger's proof of this, but I will show you a picture, which is this picture. Uh huh. So, what is this picture? Now, I've gotten to the picture, which is good news for me and maybe bad news for those of you who can't see red chalk, but this picture shows two curves. And my claim is that these curves intersect all simple curves the same number of times. Right? So that's a very difficult claim to prove because I'd have to show the intersection with all simple closed curves. So you have, to take my word for, you have to take my word for it for that. But I will show you that they're not length equivalent. Mm -hmm. So why are they not length equivalent? These two homotopy classes look very similar. In fact, the way I drew them was exactly the same until I got to here. Right? If I went around here and I look at the homotopy class here, here what I did was I crossed over once, and here I didn't cross over. So in particular, if I want to get from this homotopy class to this homotopy class, if I look at this picture here and I do a zoom, right, what I see here is two red strands that are like this. This is the zoomed picture. What I can do is I can take those two red strands and I can resolve the, the intersection by instead removing that red strand and going here and then going here. And so in particular, what that means is I can find a representative. And if, see, if, if I curve, the, if I curve the, 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 the curve a little bit, then this curve is going to become shorter. So I can find a shorter representative for the yellow one than I can for the red one. And that means that the hyperbolic representatives necessarily have an order in length that strictly that's a strict inequality. So the length of alpha and beta, the length of alpha for any hyperbolic metric will be strictly less than the length of beta. In particular, they're not length equivalent. They always have this length relationship. Right, so this is a funny phenomenon. So what do most people do when they see this type of situation? Well, they give up, right? They give up. Okay, so that wasn't the right answer. Fine, let's go home, do something else, you know, watch a nice movie or whatever. 
But what, do, what did Bin Bin Xu and, and I do? We didn't give up. We, 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 on the contrary, we thought this was, this was the beginning of something else. Like, oh, so that means, in some sense, that there's, a, there's clearly a zoo of curves that intersect simple curves the same number of times, but that aren't length equivalent. Right? And so, so this prompted us to look at the following definition. Okay? So we say that two curves, alpha and beta, are k equivalent if what happens? So what's the so zero equivalent would be you intersect the simple curves the same number of times. K equivalent is now you intersect the k curves the same number of times. So k equivalent, if the intersection between alpha and gamma is equal to the intersection between beta and gamma for all k curves. OK, so not the intersection with simple curves, but the intersection with all curves that self-intersect k times, or such that its intersection with itself is equal to 2k, as we defined before. Mm -hmm. And we'll just write this. We'll write that, in this case, alpha is k equivalent to beta. I'll use this notation here. OK. All right, so in particular, length equivalent curves are zero equivalent. Okay, so that's an example of zero equivalent, but there are examples of zero equivalent curves that are not length equivalent. That's the examples I showed you before. All right, so what did we show? So our first result is that, in fact, if you are k equivalent, then you are also zero equivalent, meaning that if you intersect all k curves the same number of times, and in fact you intersect all simple curves the same number of times. So k equivalent curves. are zero equivalent. Right? So, so how would you want to prove something like that? Just from a, you know, if, if you're, I don't know, a, a first year analysis student or whatever, you, 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 you want to prove something like this by induction. You say, okay, so zero curves, that makes sense, right? So what you really want to prove is that if you're k equivalent, then you're also k minus 1 equivalent. And if you're k minus 1 equivalent, then you're k minus 2 equivalent, and so on and so forth. Right? The problem is that that's completely wrong, because all other implications are wrong. So all other implications fail. Okay, Meaning that if I take k and k prime that belong to the non-zero natural numbers, and k is different from k prime, then there exists alpha and beta that are k equivalent, but not k prime equivalent. OK. All right, does this, uh, does the statement at least make sense? So, so as you can see, this, this is a, um, this is a completely topological phenomenon. It's, it, has nothing to do with hyperbolic geometry, even though it's inspired in some sense by hyperbolic geometry. It's really a topological phenomenon. And I'm just going to tell you one ingredient of how, does, how it works. Which in some sense was the, the most surprising bit for me. And it's something that we called the pants lemma.
and it works as follows. So I'm going to write it in a certain way that's going to look wrong, and then people will complain, and then I will explain what I mean, and I'll say that it was all in the subtext. Okay, so if I have a closed curve, then there exists a pants decomposition. P, such that, in some sense, let's see, so gamma on the surface on which I've cut along the pants decomposition is a collection of disjoint simple arcs. Okay, so, 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 so what do I mean? What I mean is this. I can choose a pants decomposition So of course my, my curve, this only makes sense if the curve gamma is not simple. If the curve gamma is simple, then there's nothing to do. But if my curve gamma is not simple, then it means it has self-intersection points that are not resolvable. So it means that when I cut along this pants decomposition, I have to still see these intersection points, right? So I, I'm not claiming that they've disappeared. But what I mean is that they look like something like this. This is what a pair of pants will look like once I've cut along them. So this is, I had one single curve, and maybe this is what I see. All right, so you say, well, that doesn't look like a collection of simple disjoint arcs. And I say, well, it does to a topologist, because if I can change this picture here, I can take the free homotopy class of arcs where I'm allowing myself to glide the endpoints along the boundary, and I can turn this into something that looks like exactly this. So I've made them all disjoint by taking the free homotopy class of arcs. So what you told, what, what you told sigma minus p is, p is the collection of curves? Yeah, p is the collection of curves, and sigma okay. minus p is the collection of pair of pants. Okay. So, what, so what I'm saying is that on each pair of pants, I'm going to see a picture like this, which means that I can sort of resolve these intersections into something like this. This is, so you might, it might look like everything, no matter what pants decomposition I take, I can do this, but that's not the case. So let me give you a non-example. If this is the picture I see on my pants decomposition, whoops, right, if this is the picture I see on my pants decomposition, there's nothing I can do to resolve these intersection points. I can't slide the arcs in a homotopy class and get rid of those intersection points. Whereas here I can. Which in some sense tells me that if the curve looks always like this, the intersections, in some sense, were pushing towards a neighborhood of the curves. So what we really see is something like this. This is one of my curves in the pants decomposition. And my curve looks simple up until here. And then it looks simple after here. And all of the intersection is coming from some form of permutation of these strands. So maybe this one comes up here and comes here. Maybe this one goes across. This one goes here and this one goes here. Okay, so intersection comes from permutation in the strands. Okay, let, let me... Let me just... Somebody was supposed to complain, no? Yeah, is, is, is it, all right, yes, okay, so would you like to complain? So maybe is something is missing in, is in your statement? Or like it's a, not, no? It's, no? it's just that when I say is a collection of disjoint simple arcs, I should put up to homotopy okay. where you were allowing the endpoints of the arcs to yes, glide. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's what's missing in the statement. Yeah. Okay, um, let me just end with some consequences of this and the techniques that we do. Okay, so I'm going to say a couple of things. All right, I'll, I'll leave that because I don't want to. All right, so, 
So, okay, so the first consequence of this, in some sense, is that closed curves are really, in some sense, simple curves or multi curves. This is why I'm getting myself into trouble with my own words, but with added crosses. Okay, and what I mean here is that you're, you're getting all the intersection from the permutations in the cylinder. And this is, this is related to a whole slightly different but related point of view by Erlandsen and Suto when they explore generalizations of Mirzakhani's curve counting functions in other contexts. And this is their theory of what are called radalas for those who have actually looked at their, their, their work. Um, that's one thing. So it's, it's one way to sort of model closed curves. The other thing is that you need lots of curves to parametrize all curves. Okay, so there's a theorem of Otal from the 1980s which says the following thing, that intersection with all curves determines a curve. So, in the case of simple curves, we saw that a finite number of curves suffices to determine all simple curves, the intersection with the finite number. Otal shows that you have to look at all, I mean, doesn't show that you have to look at it. He shows that you can look at the intersection with all curves. This is related in his, his point of view, his theorem on the uh, Bonahan's geodesic currents. This, it's more or less the same, more or less the same statement. And the last thing I want to point out is that, sort of from our work, what we get is that um, you need infinitely many curves to determine k curves. For k that's greater than zero. So more precisely, if you look at the map, if mu1 to mu n are a collection of curves, then the map that goes from the collection of k curves to the intersection with exactly these curves for any finite set of curves, okay, no matter what your size of your finite set is, is always non-injective. Meaning that you have two curves that are not the same, but that have the same intersection with all these curves that you've chosen. Okay, and with that, I thank you very much.